Welcome to the Yoga Liberty Podcast. Each week, I bring you the story of a different yoga teacher, their origins, what it was like before they taught yoga, how they got certified, and what it's like now. My hope is that through listening to this podcast or watching it, if you're on YouTube or Spotify, you will gain what you need to feel very confident to practice yoga or maybe even become certified. Everyone has a story to share. Some people's story might be like yours, others might not. Take the time to enjoy the diversity that is teaching yoga. If you would like to become a certified yoga teacher, I invite you to check out my private one-on-one instruction online 200 hour and 300 hour yoga teacher trainings. If you're listening to this before January of 2024, I'm also offering a trip to Costa Rica as part of your online certification. Either way, I would love to connect with you. Let's get to the podcast. Welcome to the Yoga Liberty podcast. My name is Angelica and I am Yoga Liberty on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, Pinterest, and every social media outlet you can possibly think of. I am in an endeavor to tell the stories of different yoga teachers and their origins. Today I am joined with one of the greatest yoga teachers of all time, definitely very influential in the Western yoga world and someone that I have studied with myself in person many years ago when I first became a yoga teacher. I welcome John Friend to the podcast. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, Angelica. Thanks for having me. So let's just get right into it. Tell us exactly, you know, what was your life like before you became a yoga teacher? Well, let's see. I'll start from the beginning um, because as early as 90, when I was only four years old, actually. So this was 1963. And um, I've been doing yoga now 50 years. But in in the 63, it was the day that JFK, our president, got assassinated. Um, I had a really bad cold flu. And my mother of Scottish origin uh, was feeding me whiskey, even for a four-year-old. So I was kind of blitzed out of my mind and in this high fever state and with this whole thing going on where my grandmother was in the house and freaking out really just, it was really a horrible atmosphere. I didn't understand that, that what was so terrible about this and then later this assassination but in that in that day and that even um the following weekend when i was still sick i was having experiences uh in this kind of altered state where i really wanted to know about why we're here i really did i wanted to know what so i i started to understand like so this man was killed so i mean we're all going to die how could why would we be put on the earth and then it would be all taken away. It doesn't seem right. So this is out of the mind of a a, a buzzed four year old, right? Mm-hmm. So, but that led me to when I was eight years old. To um, I found a little book on yoga that I asked my mother to read to me, and it was more on these stories of yogis that some of them like were in the Himalayas and they had supernatural powers. They could dematerialize and they had telepathic powers. And I just thought this is like the greatest superheroes. These are the guys that I want to be. And so right from the beginning, from like four years old and then eight years old, I really wanted to know about the mysteries of the universe. And I just thought yoga, this is, I'm not sure what it is, but this is the path. So when I, when I could read. Where more, did you even, how did you even know about yoga? You're like four years well, my old. Mo- my mother, my, yeah, my mother was a great intellectual and in our library, she had uh, books on, I don't know if you've ever heard of theosophy. So theosophy was as more of a formal organization was started in the late 19th century by a woman named, named Helena Petrovna Blavatsky and Blavatsky 
it's kind of it's a really incredible um, story in and of itself. But it was in these teachings of theosophy that um, I got some of these basic ideas that there were other dimensions, there were other realms of consciousness, and that you could literally do certain practices, and there were techniques that you could access these other dimensions that you could have incredible knowledge, you could understand the mysteries of life. So that was where I started to just, that's how I was introduced to it. And so by the time I was 13, I, I joined the local Theosophical Society. Uh, I was just, you know, this young beginning teenager, All everybody else was adults, so I was kind of like the mascot. But it's really where I was introduced to concepts of ancient Greek philosophy like Plato and Pythagoras, that there was a sacred geometry to our body. There was a, there's a sacred geometry to in nature, in flowers, in life. And it really impressed me that if we align with this other field, this universal field of deep order and beauty and goodness, that there would be these doors that would open in our perception. We would be able to have a more clear vision of what reality really is. What is this deeper reality? And this is how I started. And I and I was taught meditation. We we did a it was very kind of eclectic, but like Buddhist, uh, I learned Sufi meditation and classical yoga meditation. So, you know, when I was in high school, then I was bringing my Bhagavad Gita to school. You know, I was practicing my postures. Uh, my mother bought me a Swami Satchinananda's integral yoga book for Christmas one year. I think I was, um, it was like I was 13 or 14 years old. And so I was, you know, by myself doing this. Um, by the time I was 16, this would be like now the mid 70s. I said, you know what, after this was after a, um, a Sufi meditation workshop on one weekend that I attended that I wasn't going to eat meat anymore, because if I ate meat that I, my vibration would get mm -hmm. too dense. And my mother, you know, even though she was very open minded, she thought, you know, John, you're, you know, we're going to have to see the psychiatrist or the psychologist next week, you know. Um, but I, I've stayed with it now all these years, you know. Um, yeah, but it, yeah. but then you know I I continued through high school and then I went to school in um, both the University of Cincinnati in Ohio for physics. I wanted to meld physics with psychology and parapsychology. I wanted to understand more about how we could become more psychic how that we could connect to these other uh, dimensions and more on a science point of view. And then I, I moved to Texas and went to school there. And it was in Houston in 1980 that I started to take a yoga class in the city. It was at this place called Moonrise Meditation Center. And the guy there, <clears throat> um, if I can even still remember his name, <clears throat> but uh, Thomas John Greaves, I think is his name. And I was just a student. So I had been, you know, uh, um, practicing, never teaching yoga. But then one day, um, Thomas John, he called me and said, hey, I'm I'm not well. Can you substitute for me? Can you te substitute teach for me? And I said, yeah, just this one time. And, you know, I was scared. I didn't know what I was doing, really. But I went in there and taught. And it was, you know, I four students or something that I had. And it was, I enjoyed it. I enjoyed teaching. And then the next week he still wasn't back. And it turned out that he, Thomas John was one of the first to have be HIV positive and have AIDS, full-blown AIDS. And he didn't survive. He was one, they got him on AZT or some other drug back then. Wow. Um, and, you know, I didn't really understand really what was going on at the time. I mean, I've now done a lot of more research on the subject, but at the time it was just tragic, you know, yeah, he was really, really knew. you know, it really was no, it was brand new and 
you know, even being uh, gay at the time was was kind of underground. But I was again in kind of more of that realm of all very alternative, open minded people. And for me, it wasn't a problem. And, um, you know, he was a really beautiful man. He was uh, my practices were also uh, uh, in Wicca and paganism, and he was more of a white witch. So I I even studied with him a little bit on that um, outside the classroom, the yoga classroom. But in any case, it led me into teaching because he never returned and I took over his class. And then in 85, I took a trip. I just got in my car and went out to California and started to take more classes. I, I, I was taking also other classes in Houston um, that were power yoga or by a guy named Robert Bustani. I think Robert's still teaching these days. Um, and it was based on Patabi Joyce's Ashtanga yoga. But when I went out to California, I also was exposed to more varieties of yoga. I went, I stayed at a Shivananda ashram for a while. I went to Ananda which was a um, more of a conscious community that was based on Paramahansa Yogananda's work. Mm -hmm. So I got into that. So this that's was the, the beginning. Auto, that's the autobiography of a yogi author. Correct? It is. Yeah. I really yeah. recommend it too. That was, yeah, that was a, a early lot of book people might not know that. Yeah, yeah. It's really, yeah, it's worth stating. And there are there were branches off of his own lineage and ananda was one of those branches in any case um so i got i got a taste of a variety of these yoga styles and then in 87 i decided to go full time yoga so until after um the early 80s i started doing full time financial analysis and business so I was doing that during the day and then doing yoga and my Wiccan practices at night, right? But in 87, I decided, no, this is, I, I really feel like my calling is in, in teaching yoga. And it was like a crazy idea. Back in the 80s, most people would not choose yoga as a career, right? So, right. and I tried it for a couple of years, um, was it was very fulfilling, but I wasn't really making money. I moved back with my parents um, and they were very cool to let me come back in the house. <laughs> uh, I was, you know, a 30 year old coming back into the house. But then um, I got involved with, well, two years earlier, I, I took some classes in San Francisco with I, um, Judith Lassiter and in the Iyengar Yoga Institute. And then that led me to take it with many other Iyengar senior teachers. And it was really fantastic because they were saying, hey, there is a way that you align the body that is going to give you this more optimal health. It's therapeutic. And that really interested me because of more of my science background and looking always for these universal uh, alignments, looking for the sacred geometry. So they were very, um, very uh, precise with the alignment. And that's what I got into. And it, But at the same time, I also connected with Patabi Joyce, who was touring the United States in 87 and went to some of his classes and workshops, um, even a month in Santa Barbara with him and some of his senior teachers at the time. So I was really immersed in that world as well. So both Iyengar and Ashtanga yoga is what Patabi Joyce called it, uh, you know, power yoga or vinyasa yoga. And that was the, that was the eighties. And then in 89, I went to India and studied with Iyengar, but then afterward went traveling and went to an ashram in Ganeshpuri, which was outside of Bombay, uh, Mumbai now it's called um, Bombay. And this ashram was the old ashram of Swami Muktananda, who was a devotee of Bhagwan Nityananda, who was an amazing saint, uh, just incredible saint who passed away in 61. But Muktananda, he had passed the lineage to Guru Mai Chidvalasananda. And Guru Mai was there in residence in the ashram, which I didn't know. I, I heard that the food was very good at this ashram. 
and I had been sick in India. So I was thinking, no, I got to go to the place. I heard they have European chefs. Uh, that's where I'm going. So that's why I went there. <laughs> I feel that. And I they, meant when I was in India, I was like, my stomach, I cannot. I just, it was hard. I saw this blonde lady eating a salad in Goa. And I was like, I'm going to eat a salad if she, because she certainly isn't doing what I'm doing in the bathroom. So oh I'm going to eat a salad here. And it did turn out all right. So yeah, Indian food, it can, I can see why you would want to go there just for the food. I was in, actually, I was in Goa and I was, I got really, really sick. And I said, that's when I said, I got to get out of here. And <laughs> it was, that's a whole big story in and of itself. But I was able to get out of Goa, get to um, Mumbai, take a, take a taxi to Ganesh Puri, got there. And when I got there, they said, you know, do you, um, did you make a reservation? Do you know, um, did you write Guru Mai? And I said, like, you know, I don't even know who Guru Mai is. Um, but can you tell me where the cafeteria is? You know, they, they were not, <laughs> they were not so happy with me right off the bat, but in any case, I, um, the first meeting I had with Guru Mai, a darshan where you, you know, you go up and you formally, uh, basically it's pranaming or bowing and you just, um, a lot of times people don't speak at all, but I just, uh, I started talking to her and, um, and told her that I had been with Iyengar just, you know, the week or a couple weeks earlier. And she of course knew of BKS Iyengar and said, well, um, while you're here, will you teach some of our Hatha yoga teachers? So that started wow. me teaching, the, yeah, in the ashram. So, and then that led to a whole thing so that when I got back to the States, um, some city yoga devotees had heard that I had given a demonstration in the ashram and had taught some of their teachers. So they invited me to do workshops. So that then, that was, uh, that was 90, 91 that I started to teach in the United States and started to go around to give fundamentally Iyengar workshops. I was certified in Iyengar yoga. And so I started doing more of a national teaching workshops of, of that. And it was a lot, largely through these connections of city yoga. Um, that's how it started. And then, and then the Iyengar people, uh, some of them gave me some uh, credence, but uh, I was able to expand my teaching in that regard. And then in 95, when uh, another time that I was in India, it was for me at the Iyengar Institute, I just had a real clear kind of awakening that I was not really aligned with the philosophy, certain philosophical things of Iyengar. And this was especially after then I had been studying more Tantra with Guru Mai and Siddha Yoga. So it was there was an inner conflict for me. So I resigned my Iyengar teaching certificate in '95. Wow. I, I um, yeah, I had been on the board of directors for four years. Um, I you know so I was very deeply involved in Iyengar Yoga, but the inner conflict was such that I just went on my own, and it was really interesting because as soon as I announced that I was resigning, a lot of my friends, my colleagues really just cut me off. So there was immediate, you know, it was the first taste of cancel culture for me. Right. And so they, they just stopped, you know, the phone stopped ringing, so to speak. Right. Um, and then two years later, I, I had been working on a system of what I thought of as universal principles of alignment, which I based in large part on what I had studied with Iyengar and all these other teachers, you know, I've studied with at one time, I because I had wrote, I was writing down when I would study with the teacher in some place, I would take notes and then I would put it in my file. And there was a time that I had studied with over a hundred different teachers, um, both nationally and internationally. So, and it was a wide range, you know, and I thought, you know, it was good to be eclectic in some regards where you always can find something good to learn from everybody. And, it, and that could include that something that you wouldn't want to do, you know, and, but it was, there was always a blessing and I was always grateful for everybody that I was able to study with. So that then um, was the basis of 
a, a, a new system that I wanted to put out that was based on these universal principles of alignment and based on community. And it was more heart oriented. I felt like more bhakti oriented and bhakti yoga mm. is more about it's devotional practice. It's seeing that when you move your body or you express yourself through dance or your voice or whatever actions you do, you're doing it as an offering with love to that which connects all of us, universal spirit. So that that's what I wanted to found a new type of Hatha Yoga. Before we get into the, because this is a long story, before we get into yeah. that, I just want to clarify for the listeners, a couple of different points that you have talked about. One of the first ones was the mention of ahimsa, vegetarianism, not taking in the um, fear, pain, and suffering of animals, that that m messes with our vibration. And it is very popular in the yoga world today to say that that is not important. I hear time and time again from students and from other teachers that vegetarianism or, you know, when, when I was, when I first became a vegetarian, I was 11 and, you know, that was um, almost 40 years ago now. And for, we didn't have like veganism wasn't really a thing then, but now a lot of people are vegan, but yeah. many people will say that you don't have to be vegetarian or vegan to do yoga. And what how do you feel about that what would you say to those people yeah it's a it's a good question um first of all we have you know we take the premise that energy around us and within us is is there's a reality to it that your whatever even your environment is going to influence you so what you take in your body, the vibration of the food that you eat, let's say that it's not even animals. Let's just say that it's uh, processed GMO, uh, sugary food. You're going to, you're going to resonate and vibrate at that kind of level. And it feeds things like in your gut, right? That the, you know, mm -hmm. the sugars can feed candida and you can, you can build other type of, um you know toxins in the body but for the meat thing for me was that animals have feelings that animals have consciousness that there's vibration of every animal and that it's in for all of us our the vibration of our heart and mind is vibrating in the literally the fabric of our body and bones in our blood in our lymph everything right so if you're drinking in somebody else's um you know fluids in their blood or you eat the the flesh of an animal that who is been terrorized on the moment the the minutes of their before their slaughter that those the cortisol and all of that is in their blood it's in their body and also just the toxins that the the poor animals are fed these days right now, at the same time, having all said that, I, I I really never, I would suggest people that they should eat organic, not, you know, uh, vegetarian and so on. But I never really was, I've never been one to be hardcore about it. You know, it's like, I, I felt like that if they did, pra if they did certain practices, they would find, they would clean to a point where they would have a the inner compassions would arise naturally and the mm -hmm. behavior certain behaviors uh that were not healthy for themselves or others would just fall away more naturally so i i've never said to somebody hey don't smoke um <laughs> you know or don't don't eat meat and then and, and there were also cases that i saw where people would eat meat and feel a lot better and they said oh it it saved me and I don't discount that, that, you know, I, uh, but at the same time, maybe it was more of a, um, a short-term medicine that you took on the animal, whatever it was, protein or something for them. Um, but I don't, I, you know, I don't uh, advocate uh, eating meat all the time. And it's funny too, because we have, or not even funny, but it's interesting that I have students today that are really pro only um, animal meat eating. 
So they're only mm. carnivore, only for a car, carnivorous diet. So it's gone yeah. the other, like a whole pendulum swing. And they only want like almost like raw meat or rare cooked meat. It's wild. So it I mean, is this wild. is the world, I, this is the world we're in. I love Cameron Shane. I love what he's doing. I think he's a very powerful human being. Uh, he's the founder of Budokan Yoga for people yeah. who do not know. But um, he... He's really into the eating meat. He thinks, you know, it's just like, for me, it's so foreign. I like, I can't, I can't understand. I don't know. I'm just more like uh, the Dharma Mitra always says in class, like, don't make a graveyard of your body, you know? Yeah. 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 So it's a, it's a big subject. And um, I like to think that again, if we, when we move toward more of a balance that the things that are again out of balance will fall away mm -hmm. and so you leave you know i leave it up a little bit more to the student but i try to guide and we you know just even this last two three years especially people so many people ha have been asking me about their what to do with their immune system and um you know and interestingly too that if they eat heavier foods, that it can maybe temporarily give them an insulation, like block from some of the traumas or their fears that they might be having. But in general, I advocate for like alkaline water, clean mm -hmm. diet, a really clean diet, and, and their immune system can be strengthened instead of having to take uh, pharmaceuticals and so on like that. So I'm kind of old school when it comes to like alternative health in yeah, that, in yeah. that way. Um, yeah. So that's a, it's a very interesting and, and what's happened um, with the yoga community in regards to alternative health, especially in the last three years since the pandemic hit. So there's been a real um, even bifurcation uh, of the community, the general yoga community. And I would say that, Interestingly, a large number, I don't know what percentage, but I was, I've been kind of like blown away that many of my associates had kind of defaulted to follow what they thought were the experts in health mm -hmm. um, and to go like, don't, you know, don't go outside, wear a mask, even when you're doing yoga and um, take a, you know take a gene therapy injection um that's never been experimented on before with anybody so i was it's been mind blowing that it's it's literally the majority of the yoga community yeah i think you know went that way and it's so different because when i started like in the 70s and then even in the 80s um there was still such the yoga world. We were like the ones that were all the health guys. We were the green movement for um, the environment. We were the anti-war group that we were the peaceniks, you know, we were, it was all about ahimsa, you know, we ate and the original is, avocado toast. <laughs> right, exactly. And it was, you know, we were, we were the ones that started the juice bars and all of it. So um, it's, it, it's so different. It's so it's really it's been an inversion, and it's been fascinating to me because I got to I've been able to watch the whole thing, witness the whole thing, and I've also contributed, you know, um, inadvertently, um, and then retrospectively to see my own um, contribution to some of the corruption, if you will, or to the shadow side of the yoga community, and. Uh, I like to think in the last 10 years, I've really turned that around a lot for myself and, and others, but, but we, it's a cultural thing that the yoga world got pulled into. So it's not just the yoga world. It's a bigger cultural right. zeitgeist that it got pulled into. And so I started this Anasari yoga in the, in 97 and then started to teach it worldwide. So I went to over 30 countries, you know, <clears throat> in 15 years of teaching on Asari Yoga, um, I went all over the place to teach. And, but during that time as well, 
the community, the the bigger even in culture, there there was just much more emphasis on everybody's individuality. There was much more about um, you know the kind of a competition and from a capitalistic point of view. So there was commodification of the yoga world and it became just a big industry. I made a lot of money also in doing it, you know, because my the community, the Anusara thing was big. I was at workshops selling um at my stores, you know, my uh on the road stores. We would so we were putting out and it was clothing and everything, all your props and accoutrements of even statues and so on, right? Mm -hmm. Um, I, remember. I remember. Yeah. I so, and up. yeah. I and I thought, there. you know, yeah. and I took the money and I took, I, and I tried to feel like I was building something with it, you know? So in my mind, I thought, oh, no, this is the positive of capitalism that you, you know, we, we all, you get something that's valuable in return and then you take the money and then we're going to, we're going to help others, you know? And, um, and it's interesting now, even since, uh, I, I well, 10 years ago, I had a big scandal. This is 2012, and was then was really put out of my own community, Anusara. So, but since then, um, you know, it's been a whole different thing for me, but in a large part, it's been so much better. And so even in the 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 financial aspects, um, it's really interesting to me because I don't have that kind of financial impact, but um, I've been able to, you know, survive uh, fine and realize that I was taking all the money. And when I was building up the other, the community or donating the money, uh, it's really questionable what the legacy was. But in any case, it was, I, I did contribute and was really part of this big wave of yoga coming out of the the mid 90s that became huge worldwide internationally yeah and, the yoga journal conferences and the yeah. wonderlust conferences yeah. and all of the big and the big you know i actually getting certified to teach yoga in that in that time range was wonderful for me because i was the access that i had to world class teachers was unparalleled it's it's not like that anymore um for new teachers coming out they, they you know they have online access which is different and has its benefits but to be able to work with someone in person and to feel the energy you know i i went to a class with Patabi joy and i remember like he had an energetic presence in the room and to be able to have that is you can't do that on the internet no no and that really changes you know three years ago and that's what I've been doing mainly too, is just online and it's completely different world. It's really unfortunate. Yeah. Um, and so in any case, um, when I got out, when the whole thing fell apart for me with Anusara, I had a student named Desi Springer and she had uh, brought me um, a, a folder that had a routine in it, uh, asana, a postural routine. And so I tried it and I was blown away. And so from the practice, I started to ask her, hey, what about this? You know, where'd you get this? How'd you come up with this? And it led me to actually moving in 2012 to Denver to study with Desi. And it was from then on that we started to collaborate. And now I've been working with Desi Springer for 10 years. And so Bow Spring was something that really came out of that collaboration where there are these deeper principles of alignment. There's still the sacred geometry that I've always been looking for, but it was really from the point of view of more functional movement, dynamic posture, where a lot of times the yoga that I have had did, did for so many years was much more static, slow stretch, um, mm -hmm. even in, including some yin aspects, but, um, a much more when I would elongate the spine to try to, and cause everybody, all of us would say, yeah, one of the key things is you want your spine to be as long as possible. And to do that, we always thought, well, you take one end, like your tailbone and you, you 
anchor the tailbone down and you take your neck and your head and you stretch it up and and you're going to make that line as long as possible. And that's what I taught through all of my years until I started working with Desi. And Desi opened my mind that the space between the bones are, are such that if you line up the body in more of a wave, the, the connective tissue, the fascia, not just the muscle, but even the fascia can tone and you can literally open the spine more than if you just even try to straighten it. That even through the curve, you have this, you get an alignment that the body is designed to have more functional opening. And that kind of blew my mind. So that's how I started with Desi. Um, and this was 10 years ago. And so she and I then started going on the road until the pandemic hit three years ago. And um, and Bow Spring is spread now into like 17 countries. So that that's, you know, to give you a kind of a summary, a synopsis that gives you a kind of 40 years of my yoga teaching career. <laughs> Um, well, another thing I wanted to ask you is I, I know that your fusion was Iyengar and Tantra. And I, I think, and my, myself included, many people don't really understand what Tantra is. Can you explain Tantra yoga and give a definition of it? Yeah. And it's um, it's one of these things that is very complex, but to give it the most broad, meaning to uh, one way to even to define it too is a little bit in contrast from where it comes from historically or how it is it, it, its evolution so in classical yoga which is in large part was represented by like iyengar and most 20th century yogis i would say um were connected more to classical yoga. And classical yoga is this idea that you have spirit and yet you have a material form. Your body and even your mind is, and your emotional makeup is really separate from the spirit. And so what you do to gain access to this higher spirit is that you have to have a separation. You literally, the word in Sanskrit is called kaivalya, and you literally separate the material form, which is the mind body, from the spirit. And in Tantra is more about integrating the, the physical, the emotional, the mental with the spiritual. And so the, the in the classical yoga, the and even in Vedanta, which is is more of a later um, level of yoga philosophy or Hinduism, Indian philosophy, it still sees the body or the material world as illusion. You know, it's considered called maya, right? So mm -hmm. you try to transcend the, the physical world. You're trying to transcend your body. You're trying to, you're not your mind. You know, classically in the what, what are called the yoga sutras of Patanjali, one of the probably the arguably the most famous of the 195 sutras is Yoga Chitta Vritti Narodaha, which says yoga is when your mind basically stops. You know, you stop the sense, the cessation, you stop the vibration, the fluctuations of the mind, and then you can access this yoga, right? So the idea is about stillness, and then you can transcend, you go outside or above, right? But Tantra is about, instead of transcending, you embody. You don't try to get out of this world. You don't try to um, see your body as like just a bag of pus or, you know, some meat tube, you know, is some of the, the way that they would refer to it. Um, the, the the Tantrics would, would say, um, in the highest form, the body is a divine manifestation of the spirit. And though it's temporary and ephemeral and it's it's corruptible and it dies and everything, um, it is it's a blessing to have this vehicle, a blessing to have this embodiment. So that's why you take care of it. That's why you eat the right thing and you do these practices that bring this high resonance to your divine vehicle, this mind body. 
And so Tantra is very positive, whereas the other um, yoga systems in the Latin would be co considered via negativa, which means that you say um, the, the Sanskrit would be neti neti, like it's not this, it's not that. You don't, <clears throat> you know, you discount it, you diss it, the physical and therefore, when you diss the physical, you could also be very harsh. You know, like when I was with Iyengar in those 10 years, I mean, and Patabi Joyce as well. I mean, these guys, this was, this is hardcore. You know, many times I would get, um, you know, you get a slap or you get a hit or you get a mm -hmm. kick. You yeah. get, you know, and it wasn't that they were trying to be uh, malicious. They were, they were thinking, "Hey, you you don't you you don't need to be attached to your physical form like that," and um, that that's the old classical yogi. But the tantrika would see that the body is beautiful, and Guru Mai's teaching and Muktananda's teaching were more of this uh, lineage. Uh, specifically, it was uh, more Kashmir Shaivism which is again, a more positive Tantra, not a negative Tantra. Tantra breaks off into left and right. It gets very complex, but the left and the right, um, the left branch of Tantra can be what are considered antinomial, which means that you would do things that uh, the culture would think are really, um, you know, they not approved. It would be almost immoral. You would, you know, you you could do things like, uh, you know, left-handed tantrika would go to the cremation ground and do a practice on the body of a corpse. Mm. Okay, I mean, it would be that radical, right? So that's left tantra. So tantra in that way, um, a lot of the Tantra and even the Hatha Yoga from medieval times has more of its actual origin to the left-handed Tantra. So, oh, you know, mo sense. most people don't even know that. Most people practice yoga today as a very positive, body positive and all that. But no, the, the origins of Hatha Yoga were from more the left-handed Tantrikas and they would do incredible um harsh practices on the on the body all right wow. uh, and they would work with spirits and it was really intense and then you have another split where you have more of this philosophical tantra that has some uh lineage to this uh collective they call Kashmir Shaivism but it was more philosophical, but that really comes in the 19th, 20th century. So anyway, all of this, this Tantra is, is still all Neo-Tantra, which means that we're taking these things that we are not really connected to, especially here in the West. And we, we take these ideas and we, we reformulate them for what we have in our world today. So when we're, by, we're positive about our body, we, we could say that that's Neo-Tantra. 21st century Neo Tantra, you know, I generally align with that view. So it's more positive. I have since uh, I started studying more Kashmir Shaivism coming from Muktananda's lineage. And, um, and all of the teachings, all the times, 10 years, uh, being with Guru Mai's and Guru Mai's ashram for at least three months of each year, studying more with the scholars there, they were classical tantric scholars and teachers and that's really where i learned a lot of the philosophy but i learned all of you know classical yoga and all of it so comparative religion of hinduism buddhism all of it you know that was my that's been my background but i merged more of these ideas of classical yoga that was iyengar with tantra that was and then that became more of this anusara and now with bowspring it's really more, um, we mix even more Western philosophy uh, and we bring in Tantra. We still bring in Tantra. We still can teach more the historical overview of yoga or Indian philosophy because we just still believe that it's important to understand history. And 
this is very even counterculture today. So what we're doing in Bow Spring is completely counterculture because postmodernism in the last especially 10, 15 years has become very mainstream. And postmodernism in yoga and in the modern postural yoga is folk they focus or they they even deconstruct the whole vertical hierarchy of lineage tradition um teacher student relationship like and certainly there has been many uh gurus that um have abused power and so the response in the postmodern is to just tear down all of it you know yeah. and so you know they don't they're discounting um all of the past and not just being able to pick the the pearls out and throw you know the shell away um they throw the whole thing out so this yeah, is this I've is more post that. and and yeah. people that i've interviewed who are uh, the younger generation they're they're very you know very much patabi joy sexually harassed people and so i can't have anything to do with that or you know, we now know that Iyengar didn't understand biomechanics. What? Um, and so I'm not going to do any Iyengar, you know, and I just find it really fascinating because to me, I feel like everyone has something to share. Everyone has something of value and having the diversity of understanding actually grows you as a yoga teacher. Um, but I want to get back to when you started on Yasara and something that I've heard a number of teachers like yourself uh, Krishna Das has said this as well, that you never like really forcefully made it happen. The doors just kept opening up for you and that opportunities just kept coming for you to teach in different places and to create this new style of yoga that then became a whole movement. Um, so can you talk about that a little bit about like how it has just naturally transformed over the years and the idea that, you know, I know that in 20, 2012, I think it was when um, that big Anyasara fallout happened, that for many people would be something that just broke them. But you were actually able to transmute that into this whole new energy and create something still for the world that's also beautiful and amazing, but very different. So mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about um, how it has evolved for you just naturally? Yeah, that's a great question. Well put to Angelica. Um, yeah, so I'm very clear about that there's fate and there's destiny. So there's both things. Now, fate is like our karma, right? So sometimes you're fated in a way to cross paths with somebody. And, and then the destiny could be, well, then you have some freedom within that circumstance. What do you say to them? How do you, do you, you know, do you, um, you make an overture to, Hey, let's, you know, let's work together. Right. Um, or sometimes you, you know, we cross paths and you don't say anything and then never, nothing ever comes to, uh, with that. But, for me, like that, I chose to go to the ashram. Uh, let's say, for for instance, in '89, um, there was a little bit of fate, right? That I just it was kind of a seemingly random si situation, but then I chose to speak up. I chose to say something to Guru Mai, and there was a destiny in that. And then there was this. There is like an energy. There is a literally a power of grace there has come kind of a magic that happens and the more that you're around that magical energy then amazing things can happen so if you're kind of in that field the more and more it's like grace and good luck good fortune starts to happen so i like to think that there might be sometimes there's fate to the luck but a lot of times you make your own fate you make your own destiny or good luck you know you you create a certain mindset that's positive but then you still have to go out there and look around you open your eyes and and shift your eyes so that was for me you know when I the whole thing happened for me which was kind of like a microcosm to what's been happening in the culture I think for the last 10 years where 
um, there wasn't a, like a, a person that came forward and said, you know, oh, you you abused me or you uh, violated me. It wasn't like that. But there was um, there was a whole attack on really the the position of me as a teacher in what they would say is um, whatever e exploitation or um, you know, just a, a power differential that was not healthy. So I went away from there and literally like literally looked at myself instead of just, you know, turning and, you know, saying hey, that's that's nonsense or you're just, a, you know, taking on a victimhood mentality. Some of you, um, I really just looked at myself and that's the blessing, you know. So, you know, you look you look back at yourself and you see some shadow. Then you have to literally mm -hmm. transmute the shadow. It's not like I, I was. um you know, I like I had I presented to you. You know, I grew up in a rock, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. That's that's my background, and that you know that also became out of favor. You know, if I'm having too much fun outside right. the classroom or whatever, um, that was considered by some of abuse of power, maybe. And it's I always, um, yeah. I always felt like having been around at that time, I felt like, well, everyone was consenting adults. So I really don't know what the problem is. Like, I just really yeah, felt like- Yeah, it really, it exactly. Right. And it was like, you know, I mean, it's funny too, because it was like marijuana, you know, like criticizing or blaming me about marijuana. And Which then it becomes- legal everywhere now. Yeah, then it becomes <laughs> legalized, you know? And I always thought, well, like, if you actually liked my teachings, then maybe you thought that if I was in maybe an altered state in some of my, uh, um, you know, understandings of things, then maybe it was beneficial. But, but um, one thing I it, noticed when I owned the studio was that people held me to a much higher standard than they held themselves. And if I couldn't meet that higher standard, which of course I couldn't, I'm a human being, then suddenly I was vilified. And it was very hard. That was, a, I feel like that's a part of the yoga community that I've never been very comfortable with, was the ideology that if you are teaching yoga, you must be some supreme being who never makes any mistakes or does anything out of the ordinary or anything human whatsoever. <laughs> That's right. It, well, it's exactly right. I mean, my my big um, sin was I had an affair, and it was um, it was a, again a private matter. I felt like it was a private matter, but it became into the more public arena, and it was from that it was like, no, you have to step down. You cannot, you know, that's immoral, and um, so that that was really the crux of it. But then even still, it was like, okay. I can, I'll take accountability for that and, you know, I will change or I, I can improve and I have, but it, but if you don't have openness for forgiveness, if you don't have openness to shift, then, then none of us can transform. But if we say, okay, yeah, you screwed up. We all admit you screwed up. And then let's, let's work together to go to the next level, you know, out of love, you have a family member, you don't kick them out of the house. If, um, in general, if there's, you know, um, they make the, you know, these ethical mistakes. So, but this was the whole thing. And it never really, it was unfortunately because it never got resolved. And even when I've tried to work with the Anusara community um, uh, on the subject, you know, and just trying to get clear of the past, they just were, they're just not willing to, to clear it. So in any case, it, it's, I just go on again. That's my destiny yeah. is my fate is like, they're not going to, they're not going to, it's not going to be public what really happened. And I don't have to, um, I'm not bringing it up, you know, in yeah. general. So we just, you, you make your destiny by going to the next level. You, you have I, to. Yeah. We don't, we don't know what's going on in individual people's lives. And I think it's very unfair for us to judge that. And in this quick, culture that we're in now where the, with these like like quick doses of dopamine that we get from these social media spurts we're we're quick to make judgments and slow to realize that everyone truly is 
equal and everyone truly is the same. And that when I judge you, I'm actually just judging within me what I find as lack. Exactly. Yeah. And we, it, there's also today, you know, people get the, the information, they look at something and they read a headline or something, and then they make a, an immediate judgment. Right. And this and, is a, and what, headlines are meant to be salacious and to get you to look at them quickly. I know I use chat GPT every day and you type in things like, write me a good headline for sales that will be persuasive and get people to open this email. You know, and, yeah. and, you know, like, that's what we're going for. That's what we're trying to get is, you know, oftentimes the headline has nothing to do with the real story or, yeah. you know, in the case of what happened um, with Anya Sara, when you read the articles, there's a lot that's left there that you're like, well, what does that even really mean? Well, you know, we don't, no one knows except for you and the people who were involved in that. I know um, it's really unfortunate too because <clears throat> the the guy there was a guy that wasn't even part of the yoga community. <clears throat> He's the guy he put out a website, and one of the there were four allegations. One of the allegations was that I had um, misused or misappropriated funds, like of a pension fund. It sounded so bad, so people heard that I was like corrupted in business and. The website was up for literally like 24 hours. It was, that was all. And even oh, to this wow. day, even, yeah, even to this day, um, in different countries, people say, I heard that you, um, you stole money or for you. <laughs> and the whole thing was that it was that I didn't inform through like a self, a stamp, self addressed stamped envelope that my employees that were changing the, uh, the pension fund. And it was like some nonsensical thing. And yeah. that I, you know, within a week had the pension fund make a public statement, but it didn't matter because right. it, it was people already in people's minds. People read one headline and that's it. And it doesn't don't matter. Understand when you're running a business, I didn't know. For, I owned the yoga studio for 10 years. I did not know in that time that I was required. This is going to sound awful. I did not know I was required to carry workers' comp insurance. So for 10 years, I did not have workers' comp insurance for any of my employees at the Oak. I didn't know. It was just a mistake. I didn't know. Right. It know? Totally. And it, exactly. Like, and it was such a, my thing was so, you know, innocent. Um, I felt like it was, th there was nothing to it, but it, but it gave the headline that was really bad. And then you put that together with Wiccan practices <laughs> that are, you know, conjuring like a coven of, um, you, you know, a with, harem, a harem, with, a harem uh, of women, I heard. A harem, exactly. <laughs> you get um, women that, you know, are in sexy attire or smoking <laughs> marijuana. And, um, you, you know, you, you make, you give the, you it exploded, you know, you give this explosion. And it's sex and drugs and rock and roll. That's really what it was. That's my thing. But what the blessing is, see, for me, even though, and what it was, it was a wake up call for me because I could have gone that same, I could have gone deeper in there. And I do believe that um, we get into, we, I think we all, once we start hitting certain levels of power, money and everything, there it is very subtle and then maybe not so subtle in the way that it corrupts us, right? And um, so it was a blessing for me that I got out of that bankruptcy, everything where wow. I could really turn, turn myself to where the, back to the essentials. And <clears throat> then it was a destiny. So with, with Desi, it was amazing because then it was like, wow, this is a whole different way of looking at the body and the mind and focusing on these philosophical things where putting accountability even first, which I really didn't do, frankly, in my previous teachings, and focusing on like critical thinking, not just following the group or following the, the traditions, even the doctrines blindly, critically thinking, and, and literally then going back to, like you say, what connects all of us in our heart, our humanity, having a sense of empathy and compassion, 
these are virtues and core values that I really focus on in these last 10 years. And it's been fantastic. So in fact, Desi and I, 10 years ago, we used the name, uh, we used the word, we kind of made it up in a way, but the Sanskrit word Sri Daiva literally is a compound word in Sanskrit that means divine destiny that you literally, you have a freedom. We have a freedom that once you, you're you going the wrong direction, you're doing something that's not helpful, you change. If you figure yeah. out that, hey, what I, what I was saying, what I was telling people in alignment, you know, the thing with, you know, about the biomechanics is that we, we have discovered that certain alignments, let's say more too much external rotation in the legs, you know, can wear out the labrum or the hip sockets so that yogis, many yogis and dancers now have had to get their hips replaced this is an example. But once you learn that the rotation, that rotation is not helpful or these extremes and in trying to just take the body to the deepest level of flexibility, maybe it isn't the smartest thing. Maybe mm -hmm. that's not the way to do it, right? So for me, Bowspring is about finding this place in the middle, not in the extremes, and that anybody can do it, you know, that you mm. can do it sitting, you can do it standing, you do it walking, you do it. Wow. It's just finding a natural balance with your own unique body, but it's within a universal template still. it's There's still a universal field. It's not like it's random. It's not just happenstance or you just do whatever feels good, which is often even the the general instruction today in a lot of the yoga classes is just, this is your time. It's your mat. Do what you feel comfortable, mm -hmm. modify accordingly. And there's no parameter on this. This is not so helpful. <laughs> you know, this, there's yeah. a boundary to that. What is the bowstring experience? Like, is it, is it like going to a structured class or what happens when someone walks into your studio and you're not even really labeling it yoga so much anymore, right? Or Yeah, no, like back in 2014, in fact, Desi and I, we realized that we were going so um, divergent from the yoga world in a couple of ways. One was, again, back to the culture and the philosophy. <clears throat> um, there was... You know, I had to look at myself like what happened in my own community that that whole thing would fall apart like that after I taught them for 15 years. Obviously, something I was teaching wasn't working, it wasn't just them. I was not, you know, something was not um, being grounded. So we looked at the philosophy. We also then looked at the alignment and we realized that there were certain alignments in the yoga world that we were going in a different completely 180 antithetically different direction so we literally took the sign down the yoga sign from desi's yoga studio we took it down but we still was public classes yoga classes so people would come into a class and there was very much so much uh very similar to a yoga class where you could sit on a mat you sit you know sit cross-legged you 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 center yourself like a traditional yoga class there would be a setting of intention so setting of even a heart theme like what are we trying to cultivate here what are, what's our purpose isn't it it's not just about like stretching our hamstrings um it's not just stretching our hamstrings but that it, it's it, it's something about how are we shifting as people what is it what is it in the cultivation of our heart our mind so that we integrated our practice we integrate our bowspring practice which is very similar i thought to the way that i did it with anusara but that the alignments are really different so like if you go to a normal yoga class today anywhere in the world not just anusara but any yoga there's some general biomechanical or general postural instructions that you'll get um let's say maybe just stretching your legs straight to stretch your hamstrings or lifting and spreading your toes um, to whatever the reason is, maybe to engage your quadriceps or something um, <clears throat> to lengthen the lengthen the neck where you're making your the back of your neck more straight um, to 
take your shoulders back and down. These are these are classic standard model yoga instructions. Well, with the bow spring, we actually do things that are really different. For instance, we focus on filling up the ribs and that you literally in your thoracic spine, instead of what I used to call melt the heart in, in Anusara, which would be to get the shoulder blades flat in the back and get the upper back pretty, you know, pretty flat. <clears throat> we literally create a kyphotic curve that you literally have a fullness from inside and that the fullness is generated really from the heart. So it's generated from a sense of purpose and courage even, and uh, a dedication to something higher so that you're not feeling weak or lacking or small. You literally come into your own presence and fullness. And then with that fullness in your ribs and your heart, you can tip your pelvis and more in an interior tip. So we teach the students on how to literally engage every part of the body. So from the foot and even the toes, how to engage the up the legs into the hips um, so that all sides of the legs are engaged, all sides of the fascia and the muscle are engaged, but to create where the glutes in the hips are literally lifted upward, where almost every standard model is to pull the glutes down, to draw the tailbone, anchor the hips downward, we're literally pulling the glutes up. And that gives more power to then root down through the legs that then gives a corresponding extension up or rising up through the spine, through the, the central channel of the body. So we teach people posture, but with um, a much different alignment and we're still incorporating these heart qualities and in a more again spiritual philosophy into the practice um and part of it is we're doing these practices in the posture where we're opening like pelvic floor opening the belly opening the heart opening the throat and these positions are considered very somatically or psychically vulnerable. So it's a lot easier if you pull your chin down or you squeeze your belly flat or you you tighten your pelvic floor, you literally reduce the sensations and the sensitivity, psychic sensitivity to your body. But to open them, wow, if people get like, it can be really kind of scary. So the typical bowspring class, we have to give people even orientation. Like in the first class, we're like, before you do this, let me tell you what's going to happen. Because people would flip out in the first year or two that we were teaching bowspring, the yogis were like, oh my God, this is too intense. And it wasn't even that we were doing anything like a deep backbend or anything like that. It was that they were opening energetically in a way that they hadn't and again, it wasn't like that they didn't want to open because they thought that their yoga practice was opening, but this was at a different level. It was an energetic or somatic opening, and you have to be kind of oriented to it. And then we literally, we ask people to practice it for like one or two months regularly. They can do it at home and very simply like 20, 30 minutes a day. Very simple. Like it's honestly, it's like positions that what you would think of as remedial, just um, literally just standing or walking, but it, it it shifts the nervous system. And so then you can go really advanced. Like if you see Desi Springer do Bowspring, it's like, it's, it's the most advanced, you know, among the most advanced yoga, it's not contortionism, but it's super powerful, but it's still in the middle. It's balanced action and she's doing the, the same thing that of even somebody who's stiffer, we're still teaching the stiff person how to find balanced action within themselves and in, in, in a way that's wavy and open and dynamic. So it's not, it's not for relaxation, but it's for, um, it's, it's for dynamic posture. It's for living. It's for functional movement. It sounds like there's a, there a couple of things happening. One, very subtle movements that 
people need to pay greater attention and awareness to than maybe just moving through a flow. And second of all, that it has this element of a kundalini awakening, really, the work with the spine. It's true. It's a big energetic opening. Um, and it can be really, really powerful. It's like it's it's for me, it's been the most powerful practice that I've had in my in my whole career, in my in my whole practice. Um and it's been mind blowing that it's to think that I didn't, I never knew of it, or I knew, I didn't even know it was possible. And and what it takes is a lot of, and the reason that I didn't, I feel like I I never found it before. And I was, you know, it's a question I've asked myself so many times: is like, how did I miss this? Is that a lot of times I I would do, I would go to the position where I felt most comfortable. It wasn't like I'm going to do something that um is going to be is or weird like to bend my knee slightly in a hamstring stretch and then make literally activate my glutes going up where my lower back had a deeper curve and my belly was more open i just would never think to even it was it was never in anything that somebody had taught me before but the fact of the matter is, is that this type of dynamic alignment, I believe, is going to be more the wave of the future. So that's the, and then, if, and, and if I hadn't had the whole catastrophe that I definitely created and was the catalyst for, um, I would never be in this position to, to have found this. So that's a yeah. blessing, right? So, we, and then you got to, you have to learn from your mistakes. Think about that. We don't think about, you know, when we're in the midst of something, when we're in the midst of being canceled or uncomfortable or lost, we don't think about it truly as how it can transform our lives. We, I think we oftentimes get wrapped up into this, the experience is always monetary and mm -hmm. that that's such a small part of the, the human experience and that when we're humans, we actually go through a breath of experience we go through so many different things to have this journey of the soul while we're on this planet and that it can be really beautiful it doesn't have anything to do with monetary i, I think it's really beautiful that you're sharing this new practice I, we spent the summer in red feather lakes and i did not realize that you were in denver so uh, <laughs> i would have definitely come down um well yeah i mean we we've um we've sensed in the right before the pandemic hit we moved to georgia we moved to the woods oh okay so we we're, were in the woods in georgia <laughs> because yeah we got out of the city it was also um you know just the culture shift in so many of the american oh, cities you know denver was and, bad you know and it's like on one <laughs> level it's been um really challenging because in the yoga community there's been a more polarization more division in large part political that started back in 2015 2016 you know with the trump uh clinton thing and then it just got worse um and now with the pandemic in 2020 um i was advocating for more like natural health and for questioning uh pharmaceutical government same. you know partnerships and, and questioning you know even just so questioning everything really yeah. um yeah. and i never wore a mask I right never wore a mask. yeah we just didn't I, wear I, down here in georgia I we had, didn't we didn't wear yeah had, we didn't have to wear a mask I was kicked out of places i had the police called i had security i never i did like very strongly did not it doesn't even make sense to wear a mask it no, it doesn't. They, and again, we didn't question. And, and it was again, even though there was no science and the science only shows that it, it actually diminishes oxygen and creates more environment for bacteria and so on. People did it because it was more of a conformity and they were literally it became part of another signal or symbol that they were in a certain camp and that the other camp mm -hmm. that they considered to be a really a, a problem camp the enemy um they this they just wanted to be sure that they weren't lumped in with these this group that they had such uh negative feelings toward and the the positive for me was that i i made a lot of new friends you know i mean there was 
some of my other associates, there was been a further kind of cut off and uh, marginalizing and ostracizing because I questioned the the narrative. But I it opened me to a whole nother group of new friends. So that there's a blessing, right? So there's always the blessing. And, um, you know, I'm healthy. I haven't been sick and sued through the whole thing. And I've had to guide people who have really been really sick. And um, really, it's been really sad even having um, family and friends pass away in these last couple of years, too. So anyway, it's it's you know, these are where the times are really challenging and the practice it, that's what it's for. This is like, and now it's like mm-hmm. game time and everything I've been doing my whole life is set me up for right now, right here. So I feel like I'm, you know, it's fourth quarter, it's late in the game and I I want to be put in. So if people want to work with you and they want to experience um, the bowstring method, would they contact you on your website do you have anything um online can you can people invite you to come to their studios how can people work with you yeah thanks so much well this year is exciting because now that the pandemic or we'll see but right now uh desi and i are going back out and uh we've been online for the last three years but now we're going back uh we've done some studio work uh, like last year, but this year we're going and touring here in the United States. Uh, we're going to Europe, uh, maybe Asia, and even um, South America. Um, and people can they can go to bowspring.com. They can look at and get oriented to some of just the general concepts. There's videos or video courses they could buy too that are both introductory um, and even more intermediate if they want to go there. Um, and, and then they can come to a workshop, you know, or they can take something online, but the best really is to come see, you know, I'd love to meet, um, new friends to, to, you know, find, find where we're going to be this year on tour. This is a postural revolution tour. So we're really, we're setting this idea that there can be an evolution of what we thought. And it's not like dissing the past, right? It's like, we learn from the past and from the past, there's so many good things that we can bring forward and things that didn't work that now we know are not so good and really are obsolete. We let them go. So there is a postural revolution that for our health and it's not only on the physical, but strengthening in the heart that we can be strong to be steady and have fortitude for our convictions, what our core values are, even if they're a little bit counterculture, if they're, you know, not mainstream, they're, you know, anti-establishment. It's it's where I started back in the 70s and I'm still there. I still <laughs> counterculture. We're not, you know, um, and yet we there's such a power to conform right now and to move into the group thing. So we're we're helping people empower themselves from inside that they can have the courage to make their own decisions, to choose and and not just to go with the crowd if it's not what they really believe. So there is this inner strengthening and inner empowering that the Bowspring really affords. Um, and so it's super exciting and we'd love to really share with everybody. So um yeah we want to see you too Angelica we'll come out to Vegas. <laughs> well, uh, I would love to, I would love to see you again in person after all these years and who better to change the yoga industry and rise like a Phoenix than someone who has experienced that in their own life. Um, truly, I appreciate you. I have been um, offline um, yoga Liberty listeners trying to get John to teach us on TikTok because I know that there is a lack of this kind of breadth of experience and um, just absolute understanding of the body on TikTok. And I think he would make a revolution there. So please do that. If you would like to connect with John, you can go to his website, www.bowspring.com. I will leave it in the description below. Uh, and 
thank you so much for being on the podcast. I truly appreciate you coming on here today and talking about what you're doing, what you have done, and just telling us your story. And hopefully it inspires someone. If you are listening to this podcast and you think that there's anyone out there who could be inspired or needs to hear this story, please do share the podcast, hit the subscribe button. And I look forward to seeing you all in the next podcast. Thank you so much for joining us at the Yoga Liberty podcast. I can't wait to join you next week for another exciting podcast. If you haven't yet, check out my online 200 hour or 300 hour yoga teacher training. I'll see you next week. Thank you so much for listening. I appreciate you.